Thank you. Welcome to everyone who's joining us for the session. And uh, as usual with these Aftershocks and uh, Opportunities webinars, we really do encourage you to play a very active role, to ask a lot of questions, and to make sure you put those questions in the Q&A section. Uh, that's where the panel will see them. Feel free to put all the comments you want in the chat section, but unless our panelists are super talented, uh, then they're not going to have a chance to read the chat whilst also listening to each other and responding. So please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A section and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, and we'll be starting properly in just a minute or so. Hi, Robert. I think you're going to win one of the awards for being the most regular attender at our webinars. Yeah, and I, I do promise that one day I will send you a picture of what's actually on my bookshelf. <laughs> One of which is Brett's books, is that there? <laughs> okay, well it's six o'clock here in the UK, and morning some parts of the world, afternoon and others, and dreadfully late in the evening for others. So uh, thank you all for joining. Whilst a uh, number of the participants are um, still kind of joining the set, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of Fast Future. As many of you know, uh, we're a foresight company. We specialize in helping people explore the emerging future and publishing books about that future. And this series, Aftershocks and Opportunities, is named after uh, our latest book, uh, Aftershocks and Opportunities, where we have 25 future thinkers from around the world talking about how we might navigate through and beyond the current crisis. And today we're very fortunate to um, be pulling together an incredible panel to explore the future of financial services. The series itself is sp supported by UiPath as sponsors, many of you know them as being, I think, the second fastest growing company in America and leaders in the field of robotic process automation. And we're very fortunate to have, have Elaine Mannix with us from UiPath today, who's going to be sharing her expertise around financial services in general and insurance in particular. Uh, our full panel is an incredibly stellar lineup of people, and we're going to have them introduce themselves in a second. Uh, and just before we do that, what I wanted to do was to remind people that we really do welcome your questions. And I'd really encourage you to put those questions into the Q&A box so that we can see them and to upvote for the questions that you'd most like to see answered. Uh, we're not going to be taking questions through raised hands that we just, in the time we have, we don't really have the opportunity to do that. So to get us going, I'm going to uh, ask each of the individual panel members to introduce themselves in a second but also to um, put up a couple of opening um, questions for you to be answering while the panel are introducing themselves. And these are about which scenarios do you think are most likely for your country over the next two years? And which scenario of those four that we're presenting are you doing the most preparation for right now? So I'll launch the polling and then while we're doing that, let's, um, let's go round and have each of the panel members introduce themselves and let's start. We'll go in the order that they're actually going to be talking to you later. So, Brett, let's start with you. 
Hi, I'm Brett King. I'm the author of uh, seven books uh, based uh, on either the future or the future of banking um, at a macro level. Um, I'm the founder of the world's first mobile challenger bank called Movin, now a software as a service business in the banking space. I'm the host of the radio show, number one fintech radio show and podcast called Breaking Banks. I'm based in New York uh, for now, um, but um, looking to get out as soon as, uh, as, soon as I can. <laughs> And if you could just give us one second on what you're going to talk about. Sure. Sorry. Um, I'm going to be talking about the future of banking, at a ma banking and financial services and macro level, the key drivers for those changes and uh, how you can adapt and transform yourself and your organization. Excellent. Miranda. Hello, everybody. My name is Miranda. Um, I'm actually here to get a poll on uh, the best paint color for my office. So if anybody wants to message me on LinkedIn, let me know your favorite. Um, but I am a strategy and foresight analyst at ATB Financial, and we are a regional financial service institution in Alberta, Canada. Um, I will be talking today about three different waves I see for the future of banking and specifically how our competitor is our, our competitor pool is changing um, from traditional bank to bank competition. Excellent. Uh, let's, next, let's go to Stefano. You're muted, Stefano. True. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Stefano Trescalto. The startups and my students usually call me Mr. T. I'm a tech entrepreneur and the founder of Parpolat Capital, an angel syndicate for impact investing and financial inclusion. And uh, impact investing means that we choose to invest only in startups with a positive impact on the society. So it's not charity. We had over 400% return of investment sometimes. So, but uh, um, it's, it's really, we want to make profit doing good. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the um, biggest risk and biggest financial opportunities in the next five years. Thank you. And Miranda, you're already getting advice on uh, color choices for your room. Uh, okay, next let's go to Elaine. Hi, my name is Elaine Mannix. Uh, my background last 20 years in, in strategic change in insurance, mainly focused on the people side. Um, got a good introduction for UiPath at the start. Um, and um, in, in essence, my, my sort of real cool job lets me work with insurance customers to implement intelligent automation to solve their problems. I'm going to talk today for a few minutes about what I see is working, what's happened during COVID, um, and how the convergence of technology is going to help the insurance industry over the next five years. Brilliant. And uh, next, let's go to Cliff. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cliff Moyes. I've spent 30 years in financial services and capital markets, most of it in leadership positions. If you're thinking that man appears to be lying on a bed, uh, I am, unfortunately. I became disabled three years ago. Um, so please excuse me if I switch the camera off sometimes. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about um, using digital financial services to raise people out of poverty, uh, especially extreme poverty. Thank you. And finally, let's go to Jim Lee. Sure. Yeah, my name is Jim Lee. I'm a professionally trained futurist and the founder of StratFi. Uh, we're a boutique investment management firm focused on the question of what happens next. Um, over the years, I've found out if you want to be in the right place at the right time, it's helpful to show up a few minutes early. And uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, why the uh, business of asset management is ripe for disruption. Excellent. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to end the polling and share the results. And just very quickly, um, talk about a really interesting trend. We've been asking these same questions now since about May. And what's fascinating is in the period since May, how we've had a complete about turn. In May, most people were saying they thought their country was most likely to go for inclusive, you know, to achieve an inclusive abundance scenario, because we were all talking about a rapid end to the pandemic and a, a rapid turnaround. Now we're seeing pretty much every time we run this, uh, the biggest single vote is for the long goodbye. And similarly, the, the same was true of what people are preparing for. A really interesting shift now, more and more organizations saying, actually, this is for real. We have to now start thinking about what we're going to do if this goes on for a year or two. Uh, what are those ideas? What are those strategies? 
And I think that's actually driving a really interesting bout of innovation because we're being forced to think about that. Yesterday, uh, we, we shared the results from uh, uh, a Kantar uh, study that they're doing on a continuous basis of more than 100,000 people in 60 plus markets. And in that, 56% of the people they surveyed said their incomes had already declined, rising to 68% of millennials. And another 19% of the general population said they fully expect their income to decline by the end of the year, which is quite incredible, really, because we're talking then about around 75% of the global population thinking they're going to have less. So how do, we, how do we design for that? How do we prepare for that? So I think we've got some really interesting uh, possibilities here to explore. So I'm going to stop doing that and just do a little scene setting presentation now um, to just hopefully whet the appetite about some of the things that we're going to be talking about. And um, I think this, the, we're, we're at a really interesting point now where pretty much every organization in every sector is having to say, what is the time horizon now for our strategy? We were talking about one year, three years, five years. Some people are saying everything is being concatenated into 90 days. Others are being forced to pull forward ideas that they were talking about for five years time and doing them now. Others are in paralysis. And we know in financial services, this is whole conversation about invisible banking, invisible financial services. You're going to hear a lot about that. But I think we're all now being challenged to say, well, what does that look like and how viable is the plan that we have for it? Secondly, in terms of facing the next 12 months, we're, we're, I think particularly in financial services, there's this real challenge. Where, and we're going to hear more again from people like Brett about this, where there's this pull between trying to carry on with the strategy we had and the past and the assumptions and beliefs and behaviors that made us successful versus the, the shock of the new and this new entirely digital environment that we seem to be competing in and how do we how do we make that transition if our mindset wasn't there and that drives us to this idea of having to prepare for not just one scenario and you've already seen the four scenarios in the question this idea of you know a, a spectrum from poorly contained to global eradication of the, the pandemic and uh, uh, this evolution from potentially you know a deep and prolonged downturn to a very vibrant economic rebound which gives us these four scenarios of the longer buy, safe but hungry, the VIP economy, inclusive abundance. And what I think is interesting, as the poll showed, is that more and more of us are starting to say, well, what does it look like if we're going to compete in a world that is dominated by the longer buy? And part of that preparedness, uh, that preparation then is about saying, how do we make sure we're prepared for future shocks, whether it's health, whether it's climate change, whether it's competitor behavior or someone coming in from the outside and just turning our world upside down? How do, we, how do we build an organization that's more capable? And that in turn is driving this focus on the need for learning, not just learning about the technologies and what others are doing in our sector, but the radical ideas that are coming through from other players. In particular, one of the things I think is most encouraging is the number of people in financial services in particular who are now saying that we don't have a choice but to embed sustainability guided by the Sustainable Development Goals in our strategy. So how do we make sure that what we're doing is actually moving the needle for the whole planet? And questions being asked of financial services in particular, saying, you know, what is our role in helping ensure that people are learning new skills, growing and adapting as they lose their jobs or are furloughed or whatever, that they're fit for the future financially by acquiring new skills, also helping them think about, you know, what is our role in encouraging societal well-being and mental health? Because without those three elements, the recovery will take longer and it could be much more fragile. We also know we're having to prepare for a world where the agenda, if you like, both in financial services, but in the real economy, is gonna be set increasingly by advances in these exponential technologies that could deliver the next trillion dollar sectors. And is leading also to some radical new thinking, particularly brought on by the collapse of supply chains during the pandemic. And Miranda in her chapter in Aftershocks and Opportunities, talks about the OECD data that says supply chains are shrinking by about 52 kilometers on average a year uh, between 2013 and 2019. And now we're seeing companies, countries saying, we want to have small footprint production of everything. So we're less reliant on global supply chains and companies saying, we want to get out of the global manufacturing solutions model where we're, we're shipping everything and increasingly selling innovation and factory design to local partners in more markets. 
And so all of that starts to raise some really interesting questions for financial services about what role do we play in this kind of massive transition in sectors? We also know that you know, today the big five dominate digitally. They're responsible for the biggest chunk of growth in financial markets more, more recently. And, and we know that last year, Amazon, Apple and Microsoft all crossed that threshold of a, a, a trillion dollar valuation. It's really hard to get our heads around what that means. But if you add together Volkswagen, Boeing, Bank of America, Disney, Fox, Ford, Hilton and all these companies, you still don't get one Apple. And it's starting to give us a sense of the power of these companies and their central role. And that has led to a kind of growing understanding of the power they could have to create these closed ecosystems. We started with Facebook Libra, but we're, we're expecting that with the subscription models thrown in, new models of, of behavior inside these markets where we're doing all our transacting, we're buying everything, we're doing all our financial services inside those ecosystems. What does that mean for the rest of the financial services? And, and how does that start to change the shape of society? We also know that this acceleration of AI through these seven stages of expert systems and robotic process automation to AGI and the singularity has actually been accelerated in this time frame. We know that China has accelerated that $430 billion investment it's making to get preeminence. And pretty much every sector is trying to move faster on AI. And, and what that looks like for financial services, I think is gonna be fascinating. We also know that those advances are leading us to rethink our relationship with money and financial services. We're starting to understand that everything we have is an asset. If I'm not gonna fly for two years, can I use my air miles to pay for any kind of goods and services? How do we start to really think of a world where everything we have is a tradable commodity and what role do financial services institutions play and what platforms can they create that give equivalent to my credit for painting someone's house in my local community, my store loyalty points or the cash in the bank? How do I give them equivalence in these new platforms? We're also moving into a world where the generations coming through have much more loyalty to the platform provider and the app than they do to the underlying brand. So the, the, the question now is, will they be choosing the interface based on what's easiest rather than the, the provider behind it? Uh, we also know that there's this growing desire amongst people and communities to put money back into this, their community. So we, we hear more and more ideas of saying, you know, when I buy my meal, instead of paying $35, can I round it up by $5 and make that extra $5 an investment in the, the restaurant I'm going to? And, can we really start to create some clever solutions for investment that could scale up to you know, my purchase from Microsoft or whatever to give me equity in that firm and really start to give me more say? Uh, we know that there's, with blockchain in particular, this idea of moving to user design products, user de you know, customizable contracts, and it's already starting to happen. But how are we gonna support that in, a, in the world we move into? How do we make sure that we're keeping up to speed with it? In insurance in particular, there's a growing understanding that people don't want car insurance, uh, property insurance, health insurance. They just want insurance for every aspect of their lives. How do we start to assess those risks? How do we start to create those products that just say, you're insured, no ifs or buts? And we know that there is this big dislocation that's being accelerated by the pandemic with the scale of job losses around the world, but it was already happening with technology. And in a sense, the pandemic has accelerated that with more and more companies saying, how do we re reduce the, the scale of our, the size of our workforce so we're less at risk and use technology more to support that, which has it then led to these questions about how do we create true financial inclusion? What does it mean to be supporting people at the margins? And what role will we play in the provision of guaranteed basic incomes and services? In the UK, we have 9 million people who are on furlough, which means they're effectively on a guaranteed income scheme, but we didn't have the mechanisms for it. We know that it's more likely that many countries will go this route. What role will we play in financial services and supporting it? So that's a very rapid tour of a few of the ideas you're gonna hear more about, but really the conclusion is, how do we make sure as organizations we're prepared for a range of scenarios and not just banking everything on one option? And so with that, I'm going to stop because uh, the stars of the show are the other panel members, and I'm going to hand over to Brett, who's going to share with us uh, his thoughts, as he suggests. And I think most of the other panel members are going to mute their videos, so we're not being rude. Thank you. 
So um, we are obviously during coronavirus seeing a, a, a really s significant shift in behavior. Now this behavior is at a macro level, uh, people staying home, people changing the way they, uh, they um, socially gather, the way we go out with masks on, you know, there's a lot of behavioral shifts. If we look historically at, um, you know, other pandemics that have happened, we see similar impacts like the Black Plague, where you see a massive change in uh, equality as a result of uh, the Black Plague. Um, the 1918, 1919 Spanish flu, where you um, saw the, the first organized approach for national health care and the creation of uh, hospitals for the first time. Prior to that, most uh, healthcare was provided at a community level by a doctor who also doubled as a surgeon. Um, but for the first time, we went from, you know, the, the biggest hospitals were field hospitals for armies uh, during the wars, um, you know, to now, um, you know, for the first time having um, public hospitals. Hospitals in the UK and the US prior to that were essentially uh, hospice care or palliative care units. Anyway, so we have some behavioral imperatives that are left over from some of these crises in the past. So what behaviors are likely to impact us as a result of coronavirus when we look at things like financial services? Well, the first thing to note is we're not visiting bank branches. We're not uh, using cash as much. You know, these are all uh, you know, potential uh, vectors for transmission of coronavirus uh, right now. In the United States, um, you know, we've seen a, 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 about a 6% increase, oh, sorry, 6% decrease in the number of branches since the financial crisis. In the UK, it's, it's more significant than that. About half of the branches in the UK have closed since the 1990s. But about 30% of bank branches in the United States are basically unprofitable. And so we expect the longer the coronavirus goes on, the more likely that the temporary branch closures we've seen as a result of coronavirus will become more permanent. But there's more ma a more macro effect that's also been sped up as a result of uh, coronavirus. Um, I think most of the futurists on the, uh, the team here would agree with me that to be a good futurist, you have to look at the past. You know, while technology can predict the sort of impact of infusion of technology in society or look at the possible technology futures, what we have to look at in the past is how people behave to these changes. And that's really where get, we get the behavioral imperative for the futures that are possible, as Rohit was talking about earlier. So when you look at what's happening in the financial services space more broadly, there's two primary drivers for the changes that we've seen. Now, these changes started with the advent of the internet back in 1995, or the commercial internet, that is, not ARPANET, um, but have accelerated the, you know, the further we've got into the internet age, particularly with the emergence of smartphones. So you have, we've moved from physical distribution systems, actually I'll do it over here, physical distribution systems to digital distribution systems. This happened across the board in terms of retail. It's why Amazon has uh, had two of their best quarters, uh, you know, since their, uh, since their foundation during coronavirus. It's why companies like uh, Ding Dong Mai Tai, um, the online grocery store in China has gone up 500% in their, uh, their business in uh, coronavirus. It's why the mobile payments architecture in China um, Alipay, uh, Tencent, WeChat Pay has had nine, had nine billion transactions in the first uh, quarter of 2020. Um, you know, it's why JCPenney is, uh, is closing their stores. Brook Brothers, Brooks Brothers is in chapter 11. We've moved from physical distribution layer to digital distribution layer, and that's accelerated during coronavirus. But on the financial service side, the other element is friction. So you go from requirements to get access to financial services, what we more broadly call inclusion, you know, in the, in the old days, being a very high friction environment. So you had to come into a physical branch. You had to sign a piece of paper. You had to provide 17 uh, different proofs of your identity and your uh, address to get access to a uh, mortgage, for example, to now a world where we're going to um, low friction, low latency engagement as a result of technology. 
So most of the fintech um, and advances you've seen in the world are around banking and financial services, insurance, uh, trade, you know, stock trading, cryptocurrencies, and so forth, are focusing on this this low latency, um, very highly scalable technology form of financial services. So if you track this One over minute, time. Right. Yeah, if you track this over time, you essentially have this staging over time where we've gone from physical to digital distribution and low la low latency, uh, low friction engagement. So I call that in in uh, um, my my terminology. I talk about Bank 2.0 or sorry, Bank 1.0 being the traditional layer, Bank 2.0 being the self service technology layer with ATM and internet, Bank 3.0 being the uh, the mobile space, and Bank 4.0, where banking is just embedded in the world around you when and where you need it. And this is an inevitable trajectory. COVID has sped up that shift towards the technology first or digital dominance of uh, financial services faster than we would have expected, but it was an inevitable uh, outcome anyway. So who are gonna be the biggest banks and financial services organizations in the near future? Technology first players that can scale with very low friction engagement embedded in the world around you and, and not the traditional players that we're used to seeing in financial services. That's my uh, piece to start us off, Rohit. Excellent, thank you. Well, um, we're going to take a polling question from Brett. And then whilst we're doing that, we're also going to uh, have a couple of the, the other panel members respond to what they heard. So let's start us off with Elaine. Elaine, what, what's your take on what you heard from Brett there? I think the, the, the certainly the, the, the view on that the pandemic has, has sped up um, accelerated people's view on, on, on what's going to happen and how they're going to use technology is, is completely spot on from what I'm seeing. And, and I love that Brett's talked about we need to look at the past for behaviours. I mean, people are much more resilient than we, than we think. If we look at all the other pandemics that have happened um, and completely agree that the winners will be the people who are able to, uh, to embrace those technologies and not just to incrementally improve, but to jump forward. But really importantly, with people. I mean, I'm in a tech company now, but the people are gonna be key to this and that we actually don't leave people behind. That's gonna be a key message, I think, going forward. Thank you. Stefano, your, what's your take on, on what you heard? You're muted again. Yeah, uh, I'm muted again. It's the day of, you know. Uh, no, I totally agree, and I can see that, especially uh, in uh, fintech, banks are having issue, insurance are having issue, and uh, small player are definitely growing. Think about uh, some of the player, uh, how much money they raise, uh, Revolut, for example, and uh, it's this is not happening only in fintech. If you think Airbnb just got, just got um, uh, a loan for one billion at a very convenient interest rate. And the reason is that they have already automated the process. So uh, the real estate is going down, uh, uh, the holiday business is going down, and still they were able to raise one billion, uh, one billion investment because they have automated the process. Uh, and when the pandemic is gone, it's not my word. This is the word of their CEO. We are probably going to be the only major business surviving here. Great, thank you. Well, let's uh, let's use the the. The remaining time we've got in this slot to start uh, responding to uh, some of the questions that are coming in from the participants. So first one we have is from Mihai Popper and this one will pitch to you Brett. How and why do you think the financial industry will be affected differently from other verticals? I was typing an answer as we we're talking. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, financial services has obviously had some protection in a regulatory sense uh, from change. If you, particularly if you look at heavily regulated markets like the US, where starting a fintech, you know, like you can't have a fintech bank in the US without bank branches because of the regulatory environment, technically. Um, there are some that are sort of getting around that. But regulatory protection has slowed down innovation in financial services. So that's one element. But you've also got a situation where um, 
for financial services globally, the vast majority of the population have traditionally not had access to traditional financial services. The biggest shift in financial inclusion has come as a result of the mobile phone. And that's completely turned financial services on its head. And so as you look at what has motivated the biggest shifts in financial services, it's technology, it's not regulation. Where this sort of collides together is when you have regulators or markets starting to compete against each other for the best regulation to promote investment, innovation, um, you know, uh, services for uh, end, end customers and so forth. And at that point, then all bets are off. Things uh, change quite rapidly. But the biggest uh, shift is essentially the move from um, finance being based on a regulatory chartered based um, you know, sort of system to one that's technology first, enabling inclusion, and and you know that that is the big game changer. But that's where that's where both it's lagged in terms of you know the early dot com days. We didn't see a lot of transformation of the financial services space. It really was waiting for the smartphone for that to happen. Okay. Before we go on to the next question, just a reminder to all the participants that. I love seeing the questions come up, but I'd love them even more if you put them in the Q&A box, because those are the only ones we're going to answer. And there's some good ones coming up, but just to avoid me developing schizophrenia in the middle of the webinar, please just put the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so we've got another one come up here from Nick Rogers. Uh, again, we'll throw this at you, Brett. Um, How will banking regulation catch up with Banking 4.0 and protect the unsuspecting from large digital corporates? So I, I guess you're referring to the tech giants, um, you know, in terms of protecting them from from the Facebooks of the world and so forth. Um, the 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 answer to this is somewhat fragmented. You know, you have different levels of evolution in different markets. So, you know, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Australia, EU are all well ahead of the United States in terms of the regulatory environment. While the regulatory environment in the US has tended to protect the incumbents, that has also seen the US slip significantly behind the rest of the world in financial services innovation. Just if you take the era of mobile payments, the US is probably now seven to 10 years behind China in respect to the ability to make mobile payments. Even, even Kenya has a more advanced mobile payments architecture person to person than the United States today. You know, I still got to write a check and photograph it, you know, with my other bank account to transfer money electronically quickly because the, the standard ACH system takes about five days in the United States. So that's, that's electronic money transfers here. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of sort of the big banks and, and their play in this and the banking regulation, um, the real challenge is when we move to highly automated systems, you have to encode regulation you know, with AIs in a code base. And when that happens, we have to sort of radically look at rethinking the way regulation is uh, designed today. So that's when the big game changer is. When we put it, when we embed the rules of regulation, the laws of banking and financial services and anti-money laundering and all of those things in a code base, then, you know, you're going to see some, some radical changes and you're going to see um, regu regulated markets compete, competing based on that core AI capability. Great. Uh, I'm going to pause the questions there. There's some of the questions I think are going to be really good to bring up with some of the other panelists. And let's, um, let's uh, close out this session with Brett's thoughts on uh, the poll itself and the poll results from the question you provided. So how is COVID-19 impacting market share and business behavior in consumer financial services? Uh, I think that's fairly predictable, right? Um, what's really interesting here is uh, we've seen, if you look at just growth that's happened during coronavirus the last six months, it's been at two ends of the, the spectrum. The big banks who've already done some digitization under pressure, admittedly from fintechs, those guys have uh, been winners in the, um, you know, in, in developed markets. But at the other end, you've also had fintechs gaining traction um, because, you know, they can acquire customers at much greater scale and much lower cost during this. And so is that, re, you know, so those regional banks, the community banks, credit unions in the middle who've held off on digitization because they haven't felt the pressure for it previously, they've really lost out big time during uh, COVID. And, um, you know, the question only is uh, whether those, 
those changes in behaviour become more permanent after COVID uh, is resolved. And if you were looking at this in a year's time, let's say, what would you expect to be the kind of shift in that story, if any? The, the one um, thing you see, and it's sort of really, not, maybe it's articulated in the third one, fintechs are gaining traction, but the one thing is we're seeing also, as we did at the end of the dot-com bubble, um, you know, a maturation of how we measure the success of fintechs. That just, you know, um, customers who've downloaded your app is no longer the key metric for investment. You know, most of these players are going to have to be, uh, um, you know, a break-even, revenue, revenue positive um, you know, by the, you know, in terms of traction, um, you know, by the time they come out of this, I think it's, it's, um, you know, that natural maturation we see with the sort of technology bubbles where now we've got to get real because the money, the, the easy money for VCs is, you know, just based on, on scale is, is no longer there. Excellent. Thank you. Any final thoughts then before we, uh, we move on to the next uh, panelist? Any Anything that hasn't come up so far that's just triggered for you around the shifts going on for financial services right now and the kind of shocks we might, or if you like, inevitable surprises we might see in the next year or two as we adapt to that scenario that people talked about of the prolonged pandemic, pandemic and a slow economic recovery? Just one information that may be, may be interesting, uh, the venture capital investment that is my area, is going uh, uh, is going down. Of course, during the pandemic, it went down in almost all around the area. But so the investment in fintech in the UK went up of over twenty percent. Wow. Right. Any response to that? Or any yeah. Uh, I mean, that that largely happened because you're seeing significant market share changes from the the fintech firms there. UK is a pretty well developed fintech um, you know market. There's over 40 challenger banks in the UK alone that have fintech charters. The US doesn't have a fintech charter. You know, so that's uh, part of the structural differences there. But more importantly, you know, Monzo is an example. One in 20 Britons has a Monzo account today. Um, you know, Starling is. Uh, doing great work there. Revolut, N26, European players that have made some penetration, you know, there have all, all got some traction. So people are now used to seeing fintech brands, you know, as day-to-day -day banks. And, uh, you know, um, they've won through, they've, they've won a market share during, during this process. So that's one of it. TransferWise is obviously another one, you know, not, not now, um, you know, headquartered in London largely, but obviously pan-European based. Thank you. Well, that was a, an excellent opening to the session. We're now going to hand over to Miranda, who I hope you're there. Uh, Hello. Miranda? Can you hear me? Yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Awesome. And uh, hand over to you to pick up uh, really from where Brett left off. That's great. Yeah, so my favorite allegory for what banks are going through right now is actually Japan in the 1800s. And it's because after centuries of isolationism and protectionism, U.S. ships showed up on their shores, demanding that they open up to the rest of the world. And after years of banks vertically integrating and being protected by regulation, we're seeing regulators and consumers come in and demand that we open up to the world. In fact, consumers are actually storing more money on a Starbucks wallet than some banks that have in deposits. And there's three different waves of competition I see. They're all starting or in process right now and have different timelines. But the first one is the wave of fintech, which we've already talked quite a bit. And the pandemic has been accelerating this, especially pay tech. And a lot of the fintechs started by trying to compete. And in certain areas of the world, that was quite successful. But in certain areas like North America, it's been almost impossible because of getting a banking license. Uh, so since then, the strategy has largely been partnering or being acquired. And I think open banking might continue to shift this as uh, legislation comes in, Canada's on, it's on the horizon for us. Um, but one extremely powerful model of open banking is actually banking as a service. And that's where third party companies can essentially white label a banking license and operate successfully by using a, a chartered bank as their back end. Solaris Bank out of Germany was one of the first, and we're seeing a lot of moves into North American banking from competitors be through that model. So in the future, uh, fintechs might not only be partnership, op partnership opportunities, acquisition opportunities, but also potentially a new customer segment. And this leads us into my second wave, which is actually the big tech, which we've already touched on a bit as well. So looking at Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, 
uh, especially in the Western world. Unbundling Amazon, we're seeing they have Amazon Cash, Amazon Pay, Amazon Allowance. They have loans to businesses. I think in certain parts of the world, they might have loans for, to customers as well. And the advantage that these, these companies have is that they're meeting customers where they're at. They're just an added layer on top of what we already do and where we already spend our time. And if you look at um, you know, the super apps in Asia, a lot of them started with messaging apps and then moved into financial services. And I believe that big tech is seeing this opportunity as well. One of the big issues they have though is they're not largely trusted. And I think that's where traditional banks may be able to compete. We are still trusted institutions and while these, these uh, consumers and businesses feel comfortable giving all of their data to, to these uh, tech companies. Another issue that they have, and it's, it's not that it'll be an issue to compete, I think it's just a major missed opportunity, is that really these tech companies so far have just been digitizing financial services. They're not democratizing it or increasing access by any means. For example, the history of credit scoring, especially in, in North America, has been largely rooted in racism. And Apple with their credit card did nothing to combat this. They just slapped on a prettier UX for people. Um, and so I do believe that they, they aren't making major kind of transformational changes within the space. And that's where I think the third stage of decentralized finance has uh, quite a bit of traction. And I think that the recent trend, especially in the US of the push for equality in infrastructure in our corporate cultures, et cetera, um, there will be a continued push for equality within our financial services as well. Decentralized finance is the use of blockchain for storage of value and financial services and essentially democratizing all of our day-to-day -day banking. Um, we're seeing asset management companies, currency exchanges, derivatives, et cetera, all based on blockchain. And this could create for unprecedented and non-discriminatory access for financial services. There could be a potential for new ways to credit scoring beyond our traditional means. There's an opportunity um, due to the trust we can now build with each other to lend to each other as opposed to from getting a loan from a bank. I can lend to Jim on the call instead of going to my actual bank and it'll likely be at a cheaper uh, interest rate. There's also new stores of value through gaming assets, new, new uh, ways to earn income through the virtual economy. And so there's a major opportunity that's just being scratched on the surface right now. Um, one example of this that's really powerful is looking at real estate. There's now the tokenization of real estate, allowing for ease of home ownership, whether it's the whole house or just a brick of the house, um, which is increasing access to, to that space, which is quite powerful. The issue right now with all of this is that blockchain doesn't have the scale to be the back end of our entire financial ecosystem right now. And so there does need to be some major technology developments in that space. Where do banks fall in this future? Um, I think. We, we touched on it earlier, especially with through, through Brett's kind of presentation, we're not going to see banking as we do today. It's going to be integrated into our day-to-day -day operations. What banks will try to do with this, it won't be one direction. I think some may try to compete and partner with big tech, especially the big banks. You know, back end of Apple is a pretty powerful spot to be. Um, some may die off because they made the wrong choice or they made it the right choice at the wrong time, or some may find ways to play in decentralized finance. Um, so that's my, my little monologue and I'll open it up for, for discussion and conversation. <laughs> Where has Rohit gone? Rohit, you <laughs> Well, de decentralization is a good one because, you know, we started it off with the, uh, the tech around sort of Bitcoin distributed ledger technology. Um, but if, if, you know, if you just take identity, identity is the biggest uh, restriction right now, Miranda, you know, in terms of getting access to basic banking, you know, 25% um, of households in the US don't have a, you know, are underbanked or unbanked because they can't meet the identity requirements for a bank. So the way to solve that absolutely is sort of decentralized identity schemes, um, um, you know, and, you know, introducing biometrics and stuff like that. So that, that becomes a core part of where we go in the future. So Rohit, I just jumped in there during the silence. No, thank you, and, and uh, it's great. You were, you and Cliff were down to respond to this. Um, so you'll have seen that we've launched a poll as well related to what Miranda was talking about. So feel, please do answer that uh, and do keep putting your questions into the Q and A section. Cliff, let's. Uh, Brett, was there anything else you wanted to add? In that? No, no, no. Let's hand over to you, Cliff. Then for. I, I mean, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, mm. It started interesting Japan in the 1800s. I, I have a, a big fascination with Japan. And, and it in, ended interesting. And 
Um, I hope it all comes true. Um, big tech in the middle is the real competitor. Uh, I worry about the monopoly issue. They are so big. Uh, mm -hmm. I do worry that they can just take anything they want from anyone. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a bit of the end of banking myself, quite a lot of it, but I do worry there. It does have high utility. When you say it has trust issues, it has trust issues with me. I've got three daughters, I've got three grandchildren. Does it have trust issues with my grandchildren? I suspect not. Um, my children are probably somewhere in the middle. And then the really interesting thing for me was your decentralized finance argument, the push for equality. Uh, I mean, I love that, but I've been through this a few times, you know, in my life and um, seen it stumble. Can we get equal access to decentralized finance? You might say, well, decentralized finance by definition makes big, but you can still do things. So if I have no documents, if I have no collateral, if I have a small issues of criminal record, if my citizenship is, is not clear or is very recent, will I really get access to blockchain tech? You know, who's going to own the decentralized? And, there's, and this is the big issue. Brett's re mentioned it several times. You mentioned it as well, Miranda. Everyone's probably going to mention it. It's the, especially in the US, unbelievably heavily regulated. What are the regulators going to say about equal access? What are they going to say about decentralized finance? That's my concern. I want it to happen, but you know, I've been working in, in the US, the UK, Europe, everywhere, I suppose, eventually, um, for, for, for many years. And I know the US especially is look look at their look at their control of open banking. My God, you know, literally dragging them along the floor to it. Uh, so I'd be interested in Miranda's response if we have time for we'll Sorry for a long question. I think he's saying yes. <laughs> I can't tell. You're muted, right? Sorry. I, I keep muting myself. I'm trying to take part in my own webinar. Um, Miranda, your reaction to this? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot in there, so I'll try to hit the top of my points um, in regards to, yeah, the, the competition and monopolies. I think that the antitrust hearings this week will be quite fascinating to, to watch play out. Um, my concern and thought there, I, I sit on both sides of this. Um, my question is, how will we compete against the Asian super apps in the long run if we're not allowing for that monopoly type system because they're fully government supported um, overseas. So I am curious to see how this will all play out. And I think uh, it could end up with the Western world being a laggard for that. Um, in regards to, our, you mentioned trust and the next generation of trust. There's a study that came out earlier this week and it was, I think a fifth of generation Z are, um, they deleted one of those major social media apps because they're concerned about the amount of data collected. So. Um, I do agree that a lot of people are quite comfortable, especially how many friends I have on TikTok concerns me. Um, but I think I think there is a, a new level of education and a new generation that they don't trust experts. They're going to go figure it out for themselves. Um, and then, oh, decentralized and access. Yeah, yeah I agree with you on, on that one as well. I think that we, it's so early stage that we'll have to see how it plays out. I think there is major opportunity to shift the system and I'm hopefully optimistic that it'll be for the better but i think you're correct and it could it could be the same thing just in a different packaging so thank you can i, can, can I jump in there right here no. oh, um so um i absolutely agree um miranda's talking about super apps when when we look at financial services the big super apps of course out of china are you know and financials or at technologies platform where they changed their name be, before the ipo um but uh, you know alipay um, you know, integrated in Alibaba and then Tencent with WeChat and WeChat Pay. You know, these guys did last year $41 trillion in mobile payments. To put that in perspective, the entire plastic card market globally, $22.5 trillion. Right. And so it's it's there's no question the super apps on the mobile wallet side coming out of China already dominate consumer payments globally. And if you're in Asia or you're in Africa, you'll be using a Chinese mobile wallet most likely as your day to day discretionary spending account. 
The real question is what happens in the West because you know we're adverse uh, to facial recognition because of civil rights. So we're concerned about the, these Chinese, Chinese companies coming in like TikTok, but we haven't come up with anything better. We've stuck a plastic card inside the freaking phone. You know, that's the best we can do with Apple Pay. You know, that's not innovation. That's iteration. So um, until we really get to get our act into gear with that, um, you know, uh, the, the threat of these Chinese super apps or these super apps that are coming in and taking over. Remember, every bank channel we used to use prior to, say, the mid-1980s was bank-owned. You could only get access to banking services through banks. Today, 99% of it is technology. I want to kind of give some of the time back to Miranda. Sorry. Well, yeah. um, uh, the panel have been brilliant in answering all sorts of questions, but I am going to some of the answered questions because there's some really interesting ones. So my good friend Jamil Janjua uh, from Pakistan and Dubai asks um, a really interesting point around interactive voice response that was meant to make the banking service easier. But he's saying it's actually made it quite difficult and frustrating for older people. So his question is, how will we make sure that all the innovative new stuff we're doing um, actually be usable across the whole of society rather than young, fit and digitally literate people? Yeah, one of my coworkers once said to me, in inclusivity is based off of experience. And to be inclusive, you have to meet people at what their experience has been in the past, which I found quite interesting. And um, we did talk a bit about voice with the senior tech, um, seniors trying to bank, especially during this pandemic. And I think um, what I'm starting to think about is that the next generation of banking in, in the shorter term might actually be a competition on UX over actual product. So how can we meet people? How can we um, kind of see everybody's niche needs and adapt our product and service offering to it? Um, to be able to do that requires, I think, A, a lot of experimentation and B, um, some ethical guide guidance as well. I think ethics will also be another um, interesting conversation in the future as to, yeah, just how, how we're actually meeting people's needs, um, making sure we're not abusing data, making sure we're inclusive and uh, a lot of experimentation, I think. Okay. Um, well, there's some great questions coming in, but some of them are relevant to the other speakers as well. So I'm going to hold off those. I'm going to just take one here from Atul Grover for you, uh, where he says, as fintechs become mainstream, the issue of how best to regulate them has become more urgent. Any thoughts in that direction as, as they don't want to be shut down or create unexpected legal compliance or regulatory costs? So any thoughts coming from within a bank as to how best you regulate the, the fintechs? It's, it's hard. Um, I'm not the, the biggest expert on, you know, kind of the partnerships and, and how and regulation in regards to fintechs. It's not my domain, but um, right now I think a lot of banks are doing it one off and let's investigate this one company and see if they meet our standards and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all fintechs are regulated to banking standards, which is quite difficult as well. Um, so to be able to do that going forward, I think, I, I think standardization from, national governments is extremely advantageous. And I think that's why open banking has done so well in, in the EU is because they haven't. Uh, and I think regulators have a tendency to be followers rather than leaders. Uh, they let innovation disrupt them until they have to change the, the rules to, to keep people safe. Um, my hope is that as, you know, kind of the foresight field grows and there's more interplay and things are changing quicker, governments will start to be able to recognize how and, and in what way to respond. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think there's one solid answer to that, unfortunately, but it is a learning curve for well, sure. Well, let's close out your session then. And that yeah, question, may, may I, may I add one thing? Your session, Stefano, if you can respond to it in your session. Yeah. I want to just try sure. and manage the time ever so slightly. Um, any uh, quick responses, uh, Miranda, to your polling question? Any surprises there as to what future strategy yeah. might be? I'm actually surprised how high uh, looking for opportunities to play in the decentralized finance space is. Um, I'm optimistic that hopefully a lot of, of banks will try since I think having the capital that banks have to play in that space could move it quicker. Um, but I didn't think, I think most banks, at least from my experience in North America, they're trying to protect as much as possible. And the movement towards decentralized is so off the wall of what we traditionally do. It's, it's, it's not an easy sell to especially kind of the, the board of a lot of these banks. So I'm surprised, but I, I like that response. Excellent. Thank you for, for 
sharing your thoughts and provoking a lot of great questions and insights. Okay, let's move straight on to you, Stefano, and a chance for you to share what you're going to tell us about, particularly around uh, impact investing. Um, yes, indeed. So, um, later, those okay. So I know that I have five minutes, but I will probably need less than that because there is really one thing, one topic to focus, in my opinion, on the post-COVID world. And that is that the COVID didn't make any change to our society. It, make, uh, it made the change that were already happening to happen faster. So e-commerce, remote work, online payments are just three examples or what was already happening that get an impressive boost by the COVID pandemic. So shopper, investor, freelancer, employer, many people still used to conduct their business offline. They were forced to move digital and they're not coming back, at least many of them. So this is not just happening with e-commerce and big companies. A startup advice raised almost 80% of their funding round online. Another tech company that we are listing on the stock market before the end of the year has already raised a few million using Zoom and other online systems. So if this is true, and that comes the financial inclusion, if this is true and all the business are moving online, what happens if I cannot pay or receive money online? And it might sound strange to us because if we are in this webinar, we are already quite digital but there are 2 billion people in the world without a bank account. And I'm not just talking about uh, the poorest ranks in the society of emerging economy, but about the very core of the Western nations. There are 9 million households in the US alone with no bank account, the unbanked, and even more underbanked, meaning that they may have a mild saving account, but they have no advanced financial service, no credit card and their life basically depend on cash. That means that 2 billion people, so 2 billion potential customer, so 2 billion potential entrepreneur are completely excluded from the society of the future. And when I say future, I'm not talking about 50 years in the future, about five years in the future, because the COVID is boosting and speeding up everything. So, Next year, this year, we're already seeing this cha these changes. And I told for personal experience here, we have uh, our remote uh, team uh, uh, in different places of the world. And because they work remotely, they are quite digital. And yet, we decided to send bonus to the team member in the smallest town in East Asia because they had to buy food and such on e-commerce. And in London, where I live, uh, we use Amazon because the products are cheaper, but in there, in these countries, uh, the local market is cheaper. So e-commerce is a luxury. And uh, we employ a lot of women and single moms because we are a social enterprise and they had issue in really feeding their family. So at this, we are talking about team members that are used to be digital. Uh, think about their non-digital friend. What, what pain, what problems they are going to have to being completely excluded from the society. So some of the biggest risk and the biggest opportunity in the next five years, definitely in the next one year, don't come from fancy technology or social media apps, but uh, from easy to use fintech solution for unbanked. And these two billion people often don't have a proper ID document, they don't have a proper credit check, Therefore, they cannot open a bank account even if they want. So uh, whoever can create service to empower these two billion people to join the society that is coming with apps, with blockchain, with whatever is there, uh, this company are going to help a billion of people and are going to make huge profit at the same time. And that's exactly what impact investing is, making profit while doing good. So. Uh, do it with me, do it with others, do it by yourself on platform like Cedars. It doesn't really matter, but have a look to startups solving this kind of issue and eventually invest in them if you can, because uh, uh, the return will be huge both for your soul and uh, your wallet at the same time. Thank 
Thank you, Stefano. Great thought to end on that we can impact our wallet and our soul at the same time. Uh, let's launch your polling question and then bring in Jim, who's been sat very quietly and respectfully so far, but now we can unleash him. Um, Jim, your reaction to what you heard from Stefano there about yeah. the potential of impact investing? Sure, yeah, totally agree. And, uh, you know, by all means, COVID has um, increased momentum for digitization of all assets. But if you look at what the unbanked have done up to this point, is they've relied on cash, cash transactions, cash payment, cash savings. And now we're beginning to see cash disappear. Okay, so India is trying to go completely digital at this point. I've been hearing that a lot of retail stores in the US can't get enough coins. Those seem to be disappearing. Uh, some people are becoming more reluctant to accept payments in cash for health and personal security reasons with COVID. So I kind of wonder how the unbanked are gonna be able to transition to digital banking when physical banking, cash banking seems to be going away. Okay, excellent. Um, let's also bring in Miranda that this is a really interesting kind of dimension of financial services. To what extent, I mean, obviously whatever reactions you've got to what Stefano said, but to what extent is there a conversation in your bank on the banks you're talking to about what they do for those at the margins, whether we call them unbanked or uninsured or whatever, to what extent are you having an exploration as to what you can do for them from the point of their needs rather than what we think we can do for or to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for, for ATB, we're actually a very socially purposed uh, financial institution. So we, for, I think, five years now already have had um, biometrics for the homeless population at some of our branches. But the question does become how sustainable is this in, in the long run, especially in regards to cash, because that's a decision outside of one bank's hands. Um, the question I always have with all of this too is, you know, there could be a solution of every single person has a right to a phone, et cetera, et cetera, where they can then do payments through that. Um, but I think the identity side of things that we've talked about is quite fascinating, especially in countries where identity um, infrastructure isn't necessarily as strong. And my thinking, maybe it's going a little crazy on steroids, but um, will this ever lead us to a future where there is a social credit scoring system just to create inclusion? Where you know I can vouch for for Jim. I've met him before, so um, I say he's a four out of five star guy. Actually, he's a five out of five star guy. Um, is that going to be valid for banks to use, and and will we somehow slip into that future, whether intentionally or unintentionally? Right, um, Stefano. Let's take that question that came up under Miranda. Uh, what's your view about how do we regulate and, if you like, control the fintechs and the investment in fintechs and how they manifest in the marketplace. So Brad correctly say that uh, the, um, the US is a, an extremely regulated market and Miranda as well, and that's why it was so difficult to compete there. But um, I will add that Venezuela is even a more regulated market and still people are using the Bitcoin, the spice, whatever the government wants. So I think that that's, that's the trend. And I'm not speaking as a naive former programmer because I spent two years in regulation and lobby. So Miranda correctly said that regulators tend to be followers. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, we spent the last 10 years and also after the crisis of the 2009 uh, on uh, mm, an evolution and innovation of uh, fintech. So the regulators catch on and prevent many projects to be ex exploited in the US. But uh, with the blockchain and the decentralized finance, the change is not just going to be an innovation. It is going to be a complete disruption as it happened with the internet in the 90s. And in the internet in the 90s, I remember the Senate voting to proposing and uh, voting luckily to not stop the internet, but there were some senators quite afraid of what was going on with the internet. And they were trying to prevent the top place because the pedophiles were there and all this crazy stuff. So uh, this is happening again. Uh, we can have a, a very strong identity through the blockchain. Doesn't matter if you don't have, uh, um, if you don't have um, an ID document. 
And on the same time, we can have a very strong identity from a private system. Facebook tried to do that. And we can have a strong identity uh, through a public system like uh, China is doing. So, and like a lot of people uh, propose in, in the Western countries. So I think in the next years, there's going to be a fight between these three solution with big companies like Facebook trying to become the passport of people and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, countries trying to, you know, put everybody onto, into a control system, but they already fail with the passport. So I really believe that the solution will come from entrepreneurs, not from politicians or regulators. And then we have this incognita that is the blockchain that works. I mean, there are a few small projects that working on the blockchain, but there is an, a, an insurance that uh, do most of the regulation through the blockchain and uh, the, the revenue was about 2 billion transaction in transaction in eight months. And it's a startup company. So think about who have invested in that company, how happy it is. This is the, the future I see for the regulators. They will adapt because they have to, as they did in the 90s with the internet. Excellent. I'm going to ask you to put your investor hat on now and your uh, veg capital private equity hat on. Uh, earlier on, we touched on the role of private equity in Brett's talk. Um, Robert Coombs has asked, um, or says, private equity can be good or bad. What do you think the trends uh, are the trends that might prevent the bad, i.e. private equity doing leverage buyouts and, and then milking firms for their cash, et cetera, and then having them go bankrupt. So how do, we, how do we get good private equity, good venture capital in the world we're moving into, given the kind of power of the asset holders at the moment and, and uh, their capacity I, to invest? I, 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 well, I think I have two answers to that. The first one is uh, um, uh, how can we prevent venture capital to do leverage buyout and so on? Well, the answer is entrepreneurs. Uh, if you recall, Mark Zuckerberg, he was 26. He was offered uh, his company to be acquired by Google for 300 million. He went to the board of directors and say, clearly we are not going to sell for just 300 million because we are going to become bigger than, than, than Google. And he did, in a way. So, so on one side, we need to su sustain uh, like the cult of entrepreneurship that maybe become bad, but at least this is something that brings innovation. The other one is, I mean, ourselves. We all invest. So at, until now, we had, we were investing and trying to make money, and that was considered bad. And then we were doing charity to make our soul a bit happier. And now we can really decide to invest in companies that are good, and we crowdfunding with blockchain and so on. Even if we are small investor together we can invest a huge amount of money. So uh, it's, I think it's our decision. If we decide to invest in a lot of startups that are doing good, the end result will be good, despite what the venture capital, the professional venture capitals are doing. Okay. Uh, well, let's close out this session. Thank you for that. A very interesting perspective on it. Um, let's close out with the response to your question. Uh, the biggest shifts in power. Any surprises here? For you, Stefano. Oh, it's it's fascinating how everybody is uh, is um, yeah is looking to China and Southeast Asia. Clearly, they're doing a good job, even from a marketing point of view. And um, I'm a bit surprised that um, that people is not that doesn't look. So um, it's not so excited about what's happening in Africa. And I believe it's because Africa in this way is exactly the opposite of China. They're not so good in doing PR as, a, as an area, but they, they should, they are learning now. Some, some brilliant entrepreneurs are doing it because uh, um, if you think some of the biggest innovation now are coming from, from Africa. In fact, I'm just going to add one thing a few years ago. I saw this great promotion about uh, commercials about one of the big uh, former public company here in the UK about a prepaid card to pay 
I want to say maybe electricity, gas, or water. I don't want to go into detail because uh, because the company and because of what 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 I'm going to say in a few minutes and uh, as an amazing innovation. But the reality is that uh, prepaid cards to pay the bills with this very very simple system, mobile base, was invented in South Africa when they had this issue of finally um, erasing the apartheid and have all all these people coming from the poorest part of the society without a good document, and they had to provide them, you know, energy, gas, whatever. And they found this technology that now we use in the UK, but they invented. We are importer of technology in Europe after having spent one, 200 year, one entire era where we were exporting technology. Excellent, thank you. Well, some really interesting points coming up in that session and some, uh, the Jim Lee fan club was also speaking up, Jim. They want to hear you more. So we're going to bring you in in a second. But uh, now we're going to hand over to Elaine to, to switch tracks a little and, and give us a perspective around where, where insurance might be going in this bigger picture of financial services. Over to you, Elaine. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to see that the, the thread of discussions that we've had so far are all around social responsibility and doing good, because I think that's going to be sort of really key. And, and if I, as, as Rohit said, if we turn, turn our attention a to a few minutes on insurance, if we think back, insurance is one of those industries that is hundreds of years old. And the reason it started around protection and security was that the many pay in a small amount for the few when things go wrong. Um, the fact that over the last sort of few hundred years, we've managed to mangle that, um, and we've got a lot of manky systems to try to deal with it is a challenge we've, we've had. And, and certainly, as it's been noted, we haven't kept up in financial services with keeping that going. However, that premise still, still stands now um, and, it's, and it is our customers who are driving um, the expectations to sort of go forward. So I'm going to talk about the, what we're seeing in, in, in insurance, and insurance is our third biggest sector um, in, in looking at intelligent automation. And the first wave, which we've been going through during COVID, very much has been said before, it's about accelerating what was already in play. Everybody was looking at BCP, how quickly could they get their, their businesses continuing? And, and there was a real trend with our customers saying the people who had started on automation, um, it was giving them an edge to how they were getting people stood up at home, how they were connecting to their customers with the surge in demand on communication. Um, so a lot of it was around, it was around BCP. The people who hadn't started wished they had started doing more digital enabling technology. And around banking, we've seen very much a, a surge in helping to distribute the loans that have been promised from governments to helping with the mortgage holidays. So automations that have been helped to deal with that demand and actually try to deal with them sort of end to end and, and, and quickly and fast as, as, as people need that money. On the insurance side, digital assistance came up a lot. Um, around travel insurance and particularly around business interruption, uh, where businesses obviously were, were ceasing to, to operate or going into furlough, and they wanted to know if they were being covered. Am I covered? These are very difficult times. So implementing a lot of stuff like that is where we were seeing sort of that first wave now. And I think the, the what, what did we learn during this? And, and we talked about trust a lot, whether we trust financial services or, or not, and did we lose that over the last 10 years? But there's, there's something in particular, especially about insurance, this sort of working from home um, and having a digital workforce, there wasn't a lot of trust there. I know certainly working in the London market, if you weren't at your desk from seven to seven, you obviously weren't doing a good job. I think what's happened now is that people have recognized that people are still working very hard and probably even harder when they're working from home. And an example of sort of what, we, what we've learned as well, if, if you've got an a institution like Lloyd's of London that's been around 300 years, was never going to close its doors to people walking in with paper files, has now been shut since March and, and probably won't open till September, October and we've had to go digital on that. 
So I think the lessons learned around that can be certainly about our trust and that new models can exist. They're all looking into wave two, what is the new norm? I mean, what is the operating model? Am I going to keep everybody at home or am I going to have this big real estate in insurance? And, and the answer is probably it's going to be a bit of both, but certainly not the, the, the everybody sitting in buildings. Um, the, the convergence, I think, of tech is what's going to happen over the next two to three years. A lot of people have dabbled in insurance and, and rightly so. It's, it's, it's not easy. But bringing all this technology together that you guys have mentioned around sort of blockchain, digital assistance, intelligent automation, even structured data will have to happen. I think where we, we differ a little bit in the insurance side than banking is because most people want to go from this, you know, understand and cover to predict and prevent. It's all going to be around structured data and data and insight around it. And, and why the fintechs are having a hard time coming in is because there's a lot of experience around that and there's a lot of data around that. And we've got all these actuaries with all this information, most of it in spreadsheets, as they'll admit, um, where they've got that wealth of information. And how do you start writing, underwriting insurance without that data, without that knowledge? So I think in this wave two, over the next two, three years, we're going to see all that technology coming together to bring structured data, to look at behavioral analytics and, and, and really importantly, the privacy side of it as well. As you guys have mentioned throughout your discussions that, that will people want to, to, to give this data so they can get cheaper insurance? Will they, do they trust people to do it? And I think on the, on the wave three, where we come out in 2025, I certainly ask our customers, do they see themselves having a digital workforce? these digital assistants and we're seeing them being stood up because it's easy at home now to have a, a digital assistant to get you back online to connect to your IT to connect to your customers um, do they see that these digital assistants will sit along them to support their growth plans because most of them want to reduce costs insurance companies and most of them want to grow substantially and how are they going to do that those sort of two opposing views and when I ask them, will they have a 20% digital workforce? They sort of can go, oh, and it can be thousands of people. Are they ready for it? No. But fintechs could, could step in and do it if they've got, it, got the data to do it. So I, I think the, 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 the wave three will be profiting or uh, benefiting from that convergence of technology that comes to play from the experience that's already inside insurance companies and it's normally separated between data scientists and and uh, process improvement people or actuaries they're not all sitting together they're all sitting very linear at the moment and i think the the, the flexibility will come to deliver those new services new products will be about joining all that up um, thank you Elaine. is that okay if we, we sort of stop there and sure yeah a little bit on that piece and and um Let's, let's take your polling question and then bring in Cliff and Stefano to respond to what you had to say there. Um, let's stop sharing that and let's get... Um, so you've got two questions that we're going to launch here from Elaine around uh, what could be happening around the technologies for insurance and financial services. So while we're doing that, let's, uh, let's bring in Cliff first to, uh, to share your thoughts on what you heard from Elaine around the evolution of insurance from the short to the medium term? Well, I thought that was fascinating. It brought in things that we, we haven't touched on tonight. I was particularly interested in what sounded like uh, protectionism, uh, forgive me, Elaine, in that uh, we own the data and that puts us in a much stronger position than fintechs or should we say insurtechs. Um, that's certainly the case. And I was wondering what Elaine's view is as to how vulnerable the insurance industry is uh, to an open insurance initiative by the government, by the regulator, where they have to share the data with insured techs. And I, and I was at Lloyds of London for a few years in the 1990s as well, so I sort of understand the environment. Um, and then if they are vulnerable, um, what would be their strategy? Would it be to partner with a fintech that's requesting the data so they buy into the much better technology um, and don't lose out to, uh, to them then, then having a share of the data? Yeah, I think I think Cliff, they are. Um, they're very old institutes, hard to change. As you say, they sit on the data. 
a lot of the time they don't even know they've got the data or they can't even get at the data. So that, that's one of the challenges they've got themselves. Don't mind giving it to, externally to people. Um, they're grappling with that themselves. But back to the point that, you know, the, the statistics out that, you know, we're, we're, there's a huge um, coverage gap at the moment. We're only in the world covering 40%. And a lot of that is the uninsurable that's sitting there. Now, if you're going to make any inroads into, you know, democratizing that and allowing people to have that security and protection from insurance, you're going to have to be able to step it out. But I do think it'll have to be partnering with fintechs. Fintechs will be able to move much quicker than the old incumbents. I still think they have a huge significant place. The ones that are, I think, leading forth with partners, with enabling technology are the ones who are coming out on, on top and, and, and not dissimilar to conversations we've already had. So I think it's inevitable if we're going to actually have everybody, you know, that level playing field and have everybody have that security and protection, governments will have to step in and it will have to, and, and then it will be around privacy and not scoring people, you know, detrimentally about their profiling. Um, and, and we talked about regulation and for my sins, I've been an approved person before. And I, I think with transparency, which technology gives, which blockchain gives, the regulator will learn this and actually they'll get so much transparency. They're going to love it as soon as they understand it, that they're going to be able to see for the first time what's happening, which is way better than it has been in the past. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's bring Stefano in then just to kind of your reaction to this. Uh, particularly with, with that kind of focus on emerging markets as well and developing markets. Uh, in reaction to what you hear from Elaine, how do you see this all playing out in the emerging markets and what role do you see insurance playing? Because most of them are kind of heavily underinsured at the moment. But the question is, to what extent does the population even want insurance, uh, given that they've not had it before and it's an, it seen as an additional cost? I, I think it's really um, how easy, uh, it, it, it really depends on how easy it's going to be uh, to be insured and how easy and how good are going to be the company to explain to the people why they want to be insured. And historically, the big insurance are not really, really good at that because they come from a different world, while fintech company and apps are really good. Think about, we, we, we were talking before about uh, Revolut. So uh, they, uh, they have a strong currency conversion elements, especially at the beginning, we're not really a bank, but uh, because there is a currency conversion element, of course it was used by a lot of people traveling or your daughter is having a, 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 her university in London and you are in Spain, something like that. So these people are traveling. So they end up creating a one day insurance. You open your app, you click, click, mm -hmm. take the plane, you are insured. You come back and it was probably six pounds. You come back, you click, click, you're not insured anymore. Mm. This, this is not a way, this is something that can be easily explained to a millennial generation Z that is traveling. This is something that a traditional insurance is probably not coming into. And why you can do that, and exactly we're talking about data. So that was my question for Elaine. Why you can do that? Because if a guy has this mobile with your app, you know everything about them. Data accumulated through, through under years are useless. Uh, so that, that's probably the question I wanted to speak about Elaine, to ask Elaine. What do you think about all the data that companies like Amazon have about you and how the insurance can still be strong with their old data while Amazon know everything, know what kind of movie I like because there is Amazon movie. What kind of movie? The color of my socks. If I bought them through Amazon, they know everything about me. They really don't need insurance anymore. Elaine, I'm going to ask you to do two tasks in one. I'm going to ask you to respond to Stefano's question and then go straight into responding to the poll results as we've got as well, because we've got a couple of minutes left in your session. So if you can spend a bit of time on Stefano's point and then go on to looking at the results of the poll. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think um, Stefano is, is, is correct. For, the, for the, the new wave and the new millenniums, getting insurance and explaining it is going to be the, the, the fintechs will have the edge on that, as is there's the big tech companies at the moment. Why do I need it and how quickly and easily can I get it? A bit like you discussed earlier in, in, in banking. 
and profiling customers to give them protection would be really important. I think where the, the old incumbents come into play is the experience on the modeling. It doesn't mean they can't do it. Um, the actuary is the prediction. Um, I think it's those skills that are sort of missing right now in, in, in normal fintech worlds with that level of experience. And I think it will be both combined that are going to be the powerful ones that win at the end. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it'll be, it'll be easy to sell it once, you, once it starts going through mobile apps and you can understand that protection that's there and it's not costing much. Okay, I'm going to ask you to just take 60 seconds then to have a look at the, the two questions that you asked and, and are there any surprises there in the answers uh, that come through? No, so the, the behavior analytics has, has obviously come through right from, from Brett, Brett starting off the conversation all the way through to now. So it's, it's you know, it's obvious and, and, and there to Stefana's point that you understand your customers and what they do and how they live and what they like. I can imagine that's, that it will be the power of offering it simply that it actually makes sense and it's real and relevant. Um, the other one, the, the other one at the top, the 57% on all this technology yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's interesting. That will shift people along, but will it create huge change? I, th I think it will be, this will have incremental change for us, all of this enabling technology, but we do need to start thinking about actually how we redo it and that coverage gap and getting to the emerging markets will be the challenges over the next five years. I'm the not sure we'll get there in five me, years. The one that surprises me is in the second question, where... Mm -hmm. A third roughly of respondents, or so 31% of respondents uh, are saying, uh, agree that economic disruption will see governments uh, having to step in to acquire or create insurers and introduce lower cost, higher efficiency aut automation. That, that's quite a big shift from today. But you, I mean, you can see that possibility, but it, it's interesting that a third of people have gone that route. Mm -hmm. yeah. Espe especially like if climate change starts to impact, right? Because yeah. of the scale of it. Because governments yeah. may be the only people willing to underwrite it yeah. or, or write it off in certain asset classes. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, and Cliff has been lying uh, patiently, waiting to, to share with us. So he's had a quick sleep while the rest of us have been working. But Cliff, let's bring you in now to share your thoughts. And we've got quite a few questions that also touch on the topics you're going to talk about. So we'll fire some of those up. Okay, I'm trying to screen share. It's not letting me at the moment. Post disabled attendee screen sharing. All oh, right, let me uh, let me deal with that as well. I thought I'd enabled you. There you go. You're a co-host now. No, I'm still getting it. Host you are now. You are now. Sorry. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Yep. Okay. Share. Yep. Apologies for the delay, everyone. I know everyone's waiting for Jim. Okay. And. Your screen sharing. Um, okay. Uh, apologies for this, guys. I just need to. Oh, I'm having sorry. Uh, apologies. The screen sharing menu is now managing to hide the. Um, there is the but the icon towards the bottom right on your screen as well, Jim. Got it. Um, got it. Slideshow. Got it. Got okay. it. Here we go. Okay, so uh, I think everyone else has covered uh, everything I'm going to cover. Um, uh, anyone who knows me knows that I always uh, only ask questions to which I know the answer. Uh, so tonight I uh, defined the question and uh, I generated the answer. But please feel free to disagree with the answer. Uh, can digital financial services help raise people out of poverty in developing countries? Uh, along with climate change, I think the uh, most important question we face and they are, of course, linked. Uh, the problem is that um, I'll take Africa as an example. I could have taken other places, but it is always reported as being the most impoverished country, uh, continent, sorry, country, uh, continent in the world. It has 22 of the world's 25 poorest countries. It has 422 million people living on less than $1.90 per day. Imagine that. Uh, the 10 poorest countries in the world are all in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it has, and this might seem a bit of a leap away from the important stuff, 
350 million unbanked adults in some sub-Saharan Africa and it has a very weak financial services industry. And just to say, anyone who wants them can get these uh, slides at the end so you can look at the analysis here of which are the very poorest of the poor countries. Um, so if we're reporting how many unbanked people there are in Africa, that suggests that some people may think that banking them is a solution to poverty. And that is correct. It is the World Bank predominantly, but not only the World Bank, United Nations and very many other uh, NGOs that are talking about countries with more developed financial systems achieve higher economic growth and faster reductions in poverty and income inequality, which really does translate as banking the unbanked. Um, why do they think that? Do you just pluck that out of thin air? You know, is there no correlation or is it a spurious correlation between the unbanked and poverty, the number of unbanked and poverty? Well, the answer is no, there is evidence that there is a correlation and that evidence comes initially from, in modern times at least, from Bangladesh and microcredit schemes. The amazing Mohammed Yunus, uh, who founded Grameen Bank, which is less of a bank, much more of a social enterprise, uh, started giving very small loans to villages where uh, the villages were working as collective artisans, but they were using money lenders to fund their raw materials and the money lenders were taking all their profits. His small loans got them out of uh, debt with the money lenders and um, incredible success rate, 95% repayment rates compared to almost 50% for normal traditional bank loans in Bangladesh. 70% of borrowers who are customers of um, a Grameen Bank in the Indian subcontinent escape poverty within four years. 95% of their customers are women. But it's been much less successful in other parts of the world, including sub-Saharan Africa. So though we talk about the world as being a single place and globalized now, perhaps there are strong cultural reasons. One of the reasons it hasn't worked very well in sub-Saharan Africa is that many of the borrowers in that region tend to spend the money on food and other things and then get back in with money lenders to pay back Grameen Bank, which is kind of self-destructive. Then after that, we had microfinance. Banks watched the success of microcredit from social enterprises and decided to try and do it themselves. That has been uh, a mixed blessing. Those that really put the uh, uh, poverty issue first did best. Those that put profit first did worse. Then we had financial inclusion. The World Bank, which is genuinely interested in this, you know, I see a lot of criticism and people are very cynical about why they're involved, trying to protect banks and credit card companies, et cetera. But the World Bank saw the success of microcredit at raising people out of poverty and tried to make it a massive global top-down uh, program. They involved the banks, the credit card companies, which is why people are suspicious, NGOs, governments, financial regulators, Bill and Melinda Gates, et cetera, et cetera, literally thousands of partners they're still trying to bank the unbanked, or they were. Um, but they didn't predict something, and we've talked about it a lot tonight, surprise, digital financial services, also known as mobile money, just came out of the blue. I've got the 2010 document from the World Bank about financial inclusion, um, which was taking the microcredit model and you know making it happen everywhere. And it doesn't mention uh, anything like digital money anywhere. They had to revise it in 2016 and call it digital via financial inclusion. Um, so technology came to the rescue completely by accident. It was not predicted. It's a product of information communications technology, not the financial services industry. It's got nothing to do with banking the unbanked. Uses smartphones to receive, store and transfer electronic money, buy products and services, make payments, take out loans and buy insurance. And here's the interesting thing. It was the customers who invented it, not the phone companies. The customers found a function in their phone account management menu that was supposed to be used for topping up their money on the phone and found that they could transfer money to their friends. And of course, the phone companies, when they saw the customers doing this, were perfectly happy and started to accommodate them. Um, here we go. No bank account needed. No debit card needed. No credit card needed. You can even use a PhD Gold phone, not even a monthly contract phone. To get financial services from traditional institutions, they can now do what they want. MPs are the, the most well-known ones, which is run by Safaricom and Vodafone, lifted 194,000 households or 2% of Kenyan households out of poverty uh, between their launch and 2016. Uh, which is just remarkable. And I'll just make one comment not on here. Uh, the vast majority were households run by women. 
why was it such a big success for women? It allowed them to save because they were under uh, uh, threat of theft if they saved money. It allowed them to change their jobs from agriculture to going into business. It literally transformed Kenyan society. Hasn't worked quite as well in the poorest countries of sub-Saharan Africa because they don't have smartphones, they don't have network coverage yet, yet. So here my, my, seconds to wrap up on this part. My so conclusions can... are microcredit credit works, microfinance by banks sometimes works, mobile money has worked better than anything else in Africa. The World Bank was wrong, we don't need to bank the unbanked, maybe we should focus on mobile money instead. Or should we? Mobile money doesn't lend money. That was the most important thing in the Indian subcontinent to encourage commerce. Is our focus on phones wrong in the same way that our focus on banks is wrong? Maybe we're not as globalized as we think and we need local solutions because cultures vary. Finally, I said at the start, and I'm embarrassed that I said it because I don't like saying it, I said in Africa is the most impoverished continent. It contains the most impoverished people. It is the richest continent. We're stealing their money. And there's no point saying it's the Saudis stealing their money, it's the Chinese stealing their money, it's the Russians stealing their money. Because, you know, we in England, where I live, we started it and we're still doing it. We're all doing it. It's the richest continent in the world. The people don't have the money. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Let's um, bring in the others to uh, give some perspectives on that while we also deal with your polling question. And uh, so building on what Cliff asked us, we have a question that I'm going to launch now um, on the impact of digital financial services for the poorest. And uh, Jim, you've been waiting patiently for a while. Let's bring you in to respond. In the Your yeah. fan club will go wild in the big bleachers. That you can hear them screaming now, waving gym flags. Your turn has come. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the, the cool things that you mentioned, Cliff, was sort of the whole phenomenon around M-Pesa, which to my understanding um, really sort of evolved as an alternative currency because what people were sending each other were phone minutes. And they adopted that as a proxy for money, um, which is really pretty super cool. And you know, they did this well before people were moving money by digital networks and other places. And I kind of wonder if there are other places and other opportunities where Africa will leapfrog the rest of the world and its infrastructure. Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. The, the, the problem with me answering that is no one saw this coming. When I read the 2010 uh, uh, financial inclusion report by the World Bank, which included Bill Gates, uh, included technology firms, included uh, lots of banks, included lots of futurists, no one saw this use of smartphones uh, coming. And so it's hard for me to anticipate, um, which though I know uh, um, Rohit has, has actually got a conference coming up soon on the subject, which technologies could, again, be massively transformative. Um, but should we do that or should we address the people issue? Should we, you know, do the basics? Should we look at how to make microcredit work in um, sub-Saharan Africa? Should we look at whether it would work? You know, would, would the people start businesses? Because you've got to remember in Bangladesh uh, and India as well, these people were already running businesses. They were just in hock to money lenders. You can't just take someone off the street in a sub-Saharan African country and say, if you start a business, I'll give you a loan. Uh, it will work for some of them, but far less than Bangladesh. So I, I, I actually don't know that it's a very good question. Um, other people may have a view on a very transformative technology that may uh, leapfrog what's happening now with MPs. Uh, and other things. Um, I don't think anyone's arguing for bank branches, um, <laughs> but we'll see. Maybe it's the best way, but I, 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 and I look, I worked in banking for much of my career, but it doesn't feel like the solution to me. It feels like technology is the solution. Okay. Let's bring Miranda in with uh, your thoughts on, on what Cliff had to say. Yeah, I, ha I had a very similar thought actually, and that's especially looking at, you know, China was in a very similar situation of not, the banks not meeting their needs uh, there and that's where they completely leapfrogged over credit cards to have as we talked about one of the most advanced mobile payment systems mm -hmm. in the world and so um, I do think that this is the signal of, of the of Africa potentially leapfrogging to the next generation of financial services um, 
and then yeah, some other thoughts I had too is I think your your piece on culture was super uh, important as well. And I've heard stories of um, I forget where, but essentially communities in Africa that do and I'm, I don't know the name of it, but like a co communal pot where every month some everybody puts in equivalent of twenty dollars there, and one family gets to take it home. And and from that, communities have launched businesses, and it's really grown their economy just through that essentially savings mechanism. Um, another one I'm curious your thoughts on it, it strays a bit away from um, directly banking, but uh, universal basic in income pilots in these African nations and what those are doing for um, kind of the poverty there. I, I don't know if you have any insights on that, Cliff. Well, I mean, universal income is a very interesting point because it's practically been forced upon us during the pandemic in the UK. And you do wonder whether that's the reality is that there comes a tipping point where where it has to happen. Um, is it the right solution for Africa? Um, I think anything has to be tried. It's interesting you mentioned China because I took out of my slides a very interesting study on China which studied uh, microcredit, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, smartphone solutions in China, compared them to bank initiatives, microfinance, compared them to microcredit and found that the smart solutions work best, would you believe, for remote Chinese farmers. So remote Chinese farmers were the biggest adopters and the biggest beneficiaries of mobile money. And they have been approached with microcredit schemes. They have been approached by banks and microfinance schemes. And they actually transformed their lives with uh, mobile money. So it's not just where it's worked in Africa, it's worked in China. Um, these things seem hard to predict. Um, you think if it's going to work in Kenya, it's going to work in um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and then it doesn't. Um, uh, so um, so I, I know it's an incomplete answer, but it's an honest answer. Okay, I know Brett's got some ideas, but I'm going to have Brett feed those in in the, the Q&A discussion at the end. Okay. So I'm going to just manage the time and make sure we give Jim his full slot. Uh, to just close out your session, um, Cliff, let's end the polling and just get your take on the, the results that came up in terms of what people think the impact of digital financial services would be on poverty. Okay, uh, great. Um, well, I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? People do genuinely believe it's been transformative. Like Brett said at the very start, if you want to see the future and look at your history and the recent history of mobile money is, it is extremely positive. In Kenya, it raised 2% of the population out of poverty in uh, nine years. That's, it's just incredible. I think it's reflected in these numbers. Um, beneficial, moderate impact, um, no impact, zero. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, my view is I agree. I think it's the number one thing to try. I, I just would like to see more lending, either through the phones or through microcredit schemes or through microfinance and lending specifically to raise people out of poverty. And I understand there'll be cultural challenges. It will not work as well as Bangladesh. The reason why Bangladesh repayment rates are 95% for Grameen Bank is because nobody wants to let Mohammed Yunus down. It's a personal connection with a, an almost godlike figure. Um, you know, when it's an anonymous bank, they don't mind not paying. When it's Mohammed, they're gonna pay. Um, so, um, well, great, you know, I'm happy with that response, thank you. So are you saying that Dominic Cummings should lead the UK's um, microfinance institution? <laughs> From Durham. <laughs> on, on his way to Barnet Castle. Okay, um, right. Our final 15-minute segment is Jim Lee, who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, Jim is a, an incredible character that I've known for a long time, both as a brilliant futurist, but also a really smart manager of money. And I didn't quite realise till we were chatting the other day about just how well his funds are doing. But I think it would be advertising to go any deeper, wouldn't it? But uh, check out Jim's stuff uh, and decide for yourselves whether a man who's outperforming the rest of the indices, uh, the rest of the players on his indices by 20% um, is worth thinking about. Jim, over yes, to you. We'll talk about that. Now, can I do a screen share mode? Would you enable Absolutely. me? Absolutely. I'm going to do that thing of getting you uh, in control. Oh, you're a co-host now, Jim. You can share. You have the power. Fabulous. Ah, oh, here we go. The magic of technology. All right. Excellent. I think we're ready. So, yeah, my name is uh, Jim Lee, and um, 
I only have five minutes, and what I'd like to do is use those five minutes, hopefully, to stir up a little bit of controversy. And uh, the big thing that's going on in the U.S. is really the rise of ETFs, or the exchange-traded funds, and they're basically easily tradable baskets of stocks. And uh, this is the list of the uh, top 10 ETFs that are attracting the most asset flows as of last week. You'll notice two things from this list. Uh, first of all, uh, these ETFs are marketed by just three providers, uh, those being BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street Bank. Uh, collectively, they manage roughly $11 trillion of assets, so there is a concentration of wealth happening there. The other thing is that all of these ETFs are um, index trackers. They're all passively managed index funds, which means they don't really attempt to add value relative to the market. And if you're not adding value, really the easiest way to compete is by lowering your cost. And there has been a lot of price compression within asset management over the last few years. So if you look at the top five ETFs in this group, um, without nerding out too much, they're all correlated, which means that they sink or swim together, which makes diversification a little bit more challenging. And also the inflows of money going into these ETFs, a lot of it's coming through the new breed of robo-advisors. So these are the top five. Uh, many of them invest in ETFs and they invest using the same methodologies. And if you do what everyone else is doing, you'll probably get the same results. And what I find really interesting about this is if you look at the spread of returns between the best and the worst on normalized performance, it's just two percentage points. So this is going through March of this year and it runs anywhere from 0% to 2% annualized, it's not that exciting, okay? So when I look at this, I think, you know, if everyone's doing the same thing and they're all doing it at the same time, let's do something interesting with that information. So what I've done is I have um, developed a strategy for my clients by which we don't necessarily predict the markets, but what we do is we anticipate the flow of funds going into the markets and we get the same results. Uh, so there are two different flavors. Uh, decaffeinated is for the people who don't like excitement. Caffeinated is for the people that do. So on the decaf version, I've been able to pick up uh, roughly 90% of the returns of the S&P 500 while being vested less than 40% of the time, in other words, less than half the risk. On caffeinated, I've been able to pick up returns of about 22% per year over the last four and a half years, roughly doubling the S&P 500 with about the same amount of risk, which is pretty cool, but it's not actually the thing that I'm most excited about right now, uh, which is what's going on in cryptocurrency. I think from my perspective, that crypto winter might be coming to a close. And you know, if you look back, back in 2019, a lot of cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, lost about 90% of their value. Year to date from January the 1st, Bitcoin's up 52%, Ethereum's up 146%. That is pretty stunning. And what I think happened here is we went sort of through this awkward adolescence for crypto. Whereas crypto is no longer this cute, shiny thing anymore, yet it wasn't mature enough to do anything practical. But at this point, it's kind of like going to university. And within the next two or three years, if it graduates, it will become a functioning member of society. Um, and what's coming out of this is this whole platform of decentralized finance that Miranda talked about in which case you're seeing a lot of these crypto assets and, and blockchain based systems duplicating a lot of the functionality of the regulated financial institutions so that they can handle deposits, so that they can do near instantaneous and cheap global payments, currency exchange, lending and borrowing, uh, 
you know, at this point on BlockFi, it's pretty easy to pick up between four to eight percent interest on deposits, which is really interesting, in a zero percent world. You can do futures contracts, raise money by ICO, and you can also do things that aren't even possible uh, using traditional institutions, um, including micropayments, and I think most importantly, smart contracts. And, and that's what happens when you write legal agreements as software code that becomes self-monitoring and self-implementing. And uh, some of the platforms for that are Ethereum, Cardano, Tezos, and EOS. So pretty cool stuff. Um, this right off the press uh, came out last week where in the U.S. the Comptroller of the Currency did a private letter ruling allowing U.S. banks to open up cryptocurrency accounts for their public customers, um, which is really cool. And I'm very curious to see how they're going to respond to this. Are they going to embrace cryptocurrency or will they resist it? I don't know, but it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So um, here are some disclosures to keep my compliance guys happy. And uh, with that, um, we will open it up to questions and comments. Excellent. Well, let's, um, let's get your polling question up and uh, people can, and there's two polling questions for Jim again about uh, crypto in the next five years and then crypto in the next 10 years. So whilst uh, we're getting responses to that, you can be um, sharing your, your thoughts and they're multiple choice questions. Uh, for this one, we're going to have Elaine respond first and then Brett. Are you there, Elaine? Excellent. You're muted, Elaine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, Jim. That was, that was short and snappy, and I have to say, looking at it, it looks like you're doing extremely well. But from my point of view, don't understand most of this. Background is obviously insurance. However, interested in the in the um, crypto currency and, and how you've seen that being applied. And, and I'll ask the question for insurance because it's been floating around in the last few years and people have been saying, does it have a place? Well, what do you think in, in insurance? Do you think it will come into insurance? I mean, we've talked about decentralized for the banking side and it's going to be underpin a lot of that. What do you think from, from, from insurance? Yeah, you know, I actually think that one of the better applications might be for micro policies such as warranties and insuring small things. And if we can combine that in a digital wallet so that you can understand all of these small policies that you have and keep track of them and automate them um, in such a way that if you have objects, items that you purchased that are connected on the Internet of Things, you would have a network of sensors that would know if something broke or not, at which point you could also trigger a payment from your insurance policy without even applying for a claim. That could be really cool. So when I look at kind of all of this, I think micro payments, micro insurance policies all become economically viable with automation. Yeah, the smart contracts triggering it and it's all automated and you don't have the challenge of contacting somebody because it knows all these things are happening and the money ends up in your bank account because something has gone wrong is the nirvana, isn't it? And that if you've got this sitting behind it, not only do you understand a customer, but you know what's happening to them. Um, and, and, and there isn't this delayed process. So it's happening instantly. So I love that that convergence of all that technology makes those actually dreams actually come true that all those blocks together and 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 that's a big leap isn't it putting all of that together oh oh it is it is and and the key is to make the code and to make the platform accessible to everyone else and some platforms are easier to write for than others i mean at this point like 90 percent of all DeFi contracts are written on the ethereum platform and that's what people are comfortable with for now but there's going to be competition. There's going to be other platforms. I'm hearing good things about Cardano as well. Let's bring Brett in. What's, what's your take on crypto and, and how it's going to evolve, Brett, from what you've been hearing from Jim and your own experience? 
Well, you know, obviously China, again, is ahead on this with the central bank digital currency that they are already got trialed in, um, you know, like five major cities uh, right now. Um, so that would be sort of interesting to see. You know, can China use that to sort of reduce the US dollar hegemony? That There's a big question mark over that. But I'm very much of the same thinking, um, you know, in terms of what both Elaine and, and Jim have talked about. The game changer of this is actually when we start automating, when we start building in AI. Just think about all of the, uh, you know, the robots that are going to be running around the place, you know, self-driving cars that have to pay road tolls and, um, you know, uh, pay for electricity to recharge their batteries and things like that. There's this whole additional uh, infrastructure that we require for, um, you know, s smart devices in this world to transact. Now, this has to be built on an entirely new system. You can't have a self-driving car go down the branch and sign a signature card. That's insane, right? So, you know, you, you need to build an alternative methods alternative methods of value exchange so whether that is tokenization whether that is uh, distributed ledger technology you know it's all going to be you know ai based smart contracts um, one great example jim you may be aware of them um, but there's a, a company that works on um, uh, solar technology called Sun Exchange, which have essentially, they run their entire business on, on blockchain. They tokenize the energy produced by Sun. They call it a RA, the token, you know, named after the Sun God. And, and you know, and you can redeploy uh, those RAs to buy new uh, assets on the blockchain. It's all run by smart contracts. Those sort of smart companies that you know will sort of parallel the emergence of automation in these new technologies um you know will we'll be be using this these types of uh, you know blockchain based systems for sure jim let's get your response to that and again have you multitask and then go swiftly into uh responding to your two polling questions so start with any response you've got to brett and then uh take the polling question here we go so uh, we want to talk about the poll results here i guess yeah, yeah, unless you've got any response to Brett first from what he just said. And I apologize. I closed the poll earlier. I wanted to close the window when I closed the poll. So that was my oh, okay. smaller response sample here. But uh, yeah, number one, uh, multiple tech companies uh, creating financial and e-commerce ecosystems around their preferred cryptocurrencies. So um, yeah, there's, there runs the risk of silos, right, going on, whether you want to be on this sort of walled garden versus the next. I could see that happen. And um, one of the interesting things that I ran into at a, a, at a FinTech conference last year was sort of the response of the larger banks being really reluctant to embrace FinTech. And in the US, we sort of have this trade-off between experimentation and robustness. And I think we've erred on the side of robustness, robustness and being stable and predictable and not experimenting quite enough. And they kind of use sin, uh, FinTech as the sandbox where people can experiment in sort of a safe place. So, um, yes. And then if you look at the second question, uh, whopping majority in favor of the emergence of a dual system. That, wow, that came out really strong, didn't it? The dual system got 82% of the votes. And, and that's what I see happening, right? So. I think that for discretionary expenditures, that's still going to be using the conventional platforms. But if you're looking at micropayments and anything using the Internet of Things or machine to machine payments and transfers, that will probably be enabled by crypto. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay. Well, um, we've got a few minutes. The way we're going to handle this is we've got a few minutes left now. Let's take a couple of questions. We are going to stop uh, bang on eight o'clock for anyone that wants to leave. But I think most of our panelists have agreed to hang around for 15, 20 minutes afterwards to just, you know, have a coffee <laughs> conversation with anyone who's still here. We'll just pick up whatever questions there are. We'll do rapid fire 60 second responses. Uh, but I just want to, while, while we've still got um, the majority of our uh, participants here, thank uh, UiPath for sponsoring, thank our, all of our panelists for giving so readily of their ideas, for sharing, for commenting on each other's thoughts, and most importantly, to thank all of our participants for being here. I just want to share one thing with you for anyone that is disappearing in terms of what's next, uh, just to kind of let you know what's coming up next uh, in terms of our um, webinars. 
our next one is on the 20th of August. Uh, Jenny Kleeman, many of you may know her as a journalist. She's done a huge number of documentaries. And she's done this really excellent book, uh, beautifully researched, looking at um, where science and technology might be going in terms of birth, uh, the future of food, ec uh, external um, uteruses for birthing babies, uh, all the kind of new food technologies, sex robots, and then assisted death in using technology, so using death tech. Uh, she's a brilliant speaker, really interesting to talk to, fascinating stories. Do, do come join us for that session if uh, that um, floats your boat. And then with that, I'm going to stop and let's just take a few um, of the questions that are coming in. Um, and I'm just going to ask which of the panelists wants to take these and we'll just carry on now. So the audience can leave as and when they want. We'll carry on for, you know, till about 8.15. Uh, so the first question is from Akil Shah, who's been waiting very patiently, wants to know any thoughts on how will the tourism industry and the entertainment industry rebound? Who wants to do 60 seconds on where they might be going? I'm happy to take that as it's a specialist area. Uh, my view is they don't. Uh, if we're lucky, tourism and entertainment get, if, if we get a vaccine sometime next year, by 2023, tourism, aviation, the entertainment sector will gradually crawl back by 2023 to about 80% of where they were in 2019. That I think is probably the best they can hope for, uh, given the scale of decimation they're facing. Uh, there'll be lots of innovation, but I fear that they're not going to come back in anything like the same way for some time. Um, okay, who wants to take uh, this question? Or do you see the, the well, why don't we throw this one to you, Jim? You've just been talking about this. Do you foresee accelerated adoption of central backed digital currencies? Unmute yourself, Jim. I, I see it and it's going to be a disaster. Oh, okay. Because, because simply central institution cannot manage properly this kind of project. They were not, they were not born to be centralized. Okay, some contention there, Jim. Do you, what, what's your view? Would you agree? That, that's a really good point. And, and I think that you may see experiments in some places, perhaps where you have less stable monetary regimes. Okay, so, you know, the early adapters for Bitcoin were actually countries like Venezuela, for example, where they had hyper, uh, hyperinflation. So at that point, Bitcoin looks like a perfectly reasonable store of value. So I, I think that's where you might have it is more on the fringe and less at the core. Okay. Anyone got a counter view to that? Anyone think that centrally backed digital currencies are the way ahead? They're, they're how we create the new stability. Think of a, a, resounding, a resounding no. All right, let's take the next one. Uh, anyone got any experience with blockchain, particularly in relation to straight through processing? Elaine, is this your domain? Have you guys been working with this? Uh, yeah, I was involved actually in my last company with a with blockchain, um, and it was around um, a, a, a large um, uh, ship owner who had thousands of vessels and wanted to create an asset register with smart contracts so they could transfer their risk. Um, and it worked really, really well. But interestingly, what it did was, one, it, it, it gave them a log of all of it and allowed third parties in through blockchain to, to manage different parts of their business, whether it's their whole business and surveying it and doing all of that, or it's their cargo side of it. So it created a very a new platform for them to be able to trade. The transfer risk for insurance was, was quite interesting because what it did, it did was it made them, allowed them to maintain more of their risk and actually not transfer it, which means they could transfer it to anybody because insurance becomes a commodity then. I'll maintain X and then through a smart contract, I'll just trigger that transfer risk. Now that works worked really well for them and it will be interesting with these smart contracts, how people do it. Um, but it was interesting that their insurance, you know, contracted and, and it makes smaller, but maybe that's the right thing that they were managing their own risk much, much better with a whole host of partners. Thank you. Um, Jim, do you feel positioned to answer this one around uh, what funding opportunities do you see around disaster risk reduction and capacity building? Or does anyone else have a view uh, 
um, around this? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of see it as uh, potential applications for risk sharing. You know, if you look at the origins of uh, the insurance industry, it had to do with the underwriting of voyages um, in the 1600s, I think, right? Ship voyages for mercantile boats. Um, what's interesting is that the insurance industry was one of the first applications of big data. And it's one of the reasons why we have relatively few insurers that are relatively large because they have a better pool of data which enables them to make smarter bets. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the next one down uh, from Annette Gardner. Well, let's throw this one at you, Cliff. Um, Kickstarter has been around long enough to generate data on positive impacts, such as providing funding to projects that might otherwise go unfunded. What do we really know about its impacts? Has it been found to lift people out of poverty and is it the future? Um, so uh, two answers. One, it has been a success. Uh, businesses that would not have got funded otherwise have uh, got funded and succeeded. Um, I don't have the current statistics as to their uh, success rate, but I think we should regard it as a success. Okay. Did anyone anyone look 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 at you on crowdfunding and, and its impact? Sorry, crowdfunding? Well, has anyone else got a view on platforms like Kickstarter, these crowdfunding type platforms? Anyone else got a view on what their impact might be in long term? Uh, you know, uh, this, this sort of comes back to the Africa question as well, is if you think about how Africa is going to explode from a commerce perspective, you know, they're not going to build internet-based businesses in the classical way. It's going to be very greenfield or a mobile commerce. You know, we're going to be using technologies like mesh networking and, you know, Starlink from uh, Tesla to get digital inclusion. But the whole boom out of there is, is probably going to have learned from sort of the cooperative sort of style uh, that social media brings to us, at, uh, empowered by these this sort of new businesses created greenfield on mobile platforms. So I think where it gets really interesting is how do we mobilize a capital for that next boom in Africa around e-commerce? And I think this sort of community-based um, sort of investment stuff is, is going to be uh, quite popular there. Okay. I should probably add that nobody who was po actually genuinely stuck in poverty with no chance of escape, ever started a, a Kickstarter project. You, you, you know, culturally, the, the, the actual people who are genuinely in extreme poverty, you know, they, they haven't heard of Kickstarter. And if, you know, if Kickstarter had a front door and they walked in the door, security would throw them out. So, you know, it's, uh, it's been very positive. I agree entirely with Brett. It's actually the model of, of uh, cooperation is absolutely going to work well for Africa and other areas, but Kickstarter never helped, helped anyone in poverty. Great success though it is, and I'm a big fan. Okay, we've got one here that I'm gonna throw at you, Miranda, from Robert Coombs. Uh, why would I want to use a cryptocurrency other than for privacy or tax evasion purposes, or to, or to launder my cash? Yeah, that's I've a great that question. <laughs> I think uh, the really exciting thing about cryptocurrency is not just currency, but tokenization. So this branch of technology is unlocking a store of assets that we've never seen before. So instead of you know having to buy a house to get to actually use it and have ownership in it, um, instead we get tokens that are interchangeable with any other asset. So I can exchange my shares in a house for your shares in a painting or something like that. And by opening up that share of um, value, it's a whole new ecosystem and economy that we can now play with. Um, on an individual level, kind of, it'll be up to to the kind of the future to decide the true value in it. Um, but I think this, the exchange of value is the real power there. Okay, uh, here's one for you, Elaine, uh, from Nick Rogers. Uh, does it mean that if we can see a series of events happening due to blockchain, AI, and crypto, the, then can we stop bad events or outcomes before they happen? Is this where the kind of work you do is a natural precursor to actually predicting and preventing fraud and, and undesirable events in, in the value chain? Well, there's a lot of work done, done, done around fraud that you can do it and cyber risk. Obviously, there are two that are on the uprise and there's a lot can be done around this data and spotting them and, and looking at trends. And, and you do need a huge amount of data 
um, and machine learning to be able to predict that. So, so that's already happening. That's already on the rise. I think prevention is all ar ar around risk management and mitigation, which means it's, it's helping you to educate you that it doesn't happen if it's car crashes or if it's in businesses that, that stuff happen. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's always going to be a lot of catastrophes. We're going to have to just manage them better. So there's two extremes from the individual sort of risks to actually the, the huge ones. But, but are we able to manage those a lot better? And and the consequences of them. Of, co of course we are. The more we know, the better we can do it. Um, but there is spectrums on, 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 on how we can do it. Um, but certainly to, to, to prevention and being able to predict things, I, I think that's going to be the way forward, especially on the risk modeling. Um, and, and I love that, that sort of Jim, Jim referenced the, the, the fact that, you know, insurance are a bunch of bookies. The better they get at it, you know, and the more they can risk, because certainly that's what I thought when I joined it. Um, was that you're, you're playing the numbers. But if you can educate people more, which is what we can do, which is on that blockchain example I gave earlier, educate yourself more about managing risk and mitigating it before you transfer it. Excellent. Uh, one here we're going to throw at you, Stefano, because it was directed at you, uh, from Vivekanand Single. Uh, and he said, what's the future of social stock exchanges? Do you see... Uh, them emerging as an option for raising capital for social enterprises? Uh, partly yes, but I'm always a bit concerned when something good is uh, concentrated in, uh, in a specific box. Like, uh, in my opinion, we should not concentrate social enterprise in social stock exchange. We should find a way to make social enterprise as much as profitable as every other enterprise. And so the investor are going to invest because he's happy, because he's a capitalist, and because it's because it's ego, not just because it's it's good. Or else we risk to have you know a small number of uh, fancy liberal going to these places just to feel good about themselves, and the real big capital going to other places where there are no rules and just all the company are evil. Right. Um, uh, we've got one here that I'm going to throw at you, Brett. Um, given the banks, this is from Atul Grover, and I'm sort of paraphrasing. Given the banks are struggling today to ensure the validity of their AI models, uh, how are fintech firms evolving to deal uh, with explainable AI? Uh, well, you know, mostly it comes through a different view of the data. You know, um, if you look at the way banks are organized, they've got a lot of siloed data. They've got incredible data, but it's all siloed. So sort of trying to pull it all together to build behavioral models is tough. You've got to build data lakes and so forth. So when fintechs start on this, they start with a completely new stack without those silos and constraints, and they look for different models that might come in. You know, one example is, you know, uh, Cliff has talked about credit. You know, Jim has talked about credit. Miranda mentioned it as well. One great example of this is Lending Club. They got one data point, which is, is, 80% more accurate at predicting default risk taking a loan than a credit score in the United States. And it's whether you pay your phone bill every month on time. That single point of data. Now, do banks have access to that data? No, you know, not necessarily. Um, what are other behavioral data is important? Um, you know, one of the great uh, uh, scenarios I, I put in bank form, my book, uh, talking about potential credit offerings is you go to a grocery store and today what happens is you fill up your cart, you get to the checkout and um, you, know, you, you find out your salary hasn't hit the account. You, you find that out when your cart has declined and the cashier says, I'm very sorry, your card's been declined. And so you say, oh, well, let you try this one, right? Whereas fintechs would look at that from a first principles perspective and say, hey, you don't need a credit card. You don't need plastic. When you walk in the grocery store, I already know whether you can afford your usual grocery purchase or not. If you don't have enough in the bank account, I can offer you credit to cover it. You know, and so it's those sort of behavioral models in AI that are really going to make the difference in terms of experiential banking. Again, Miranda talked about this as well, experiential banking embedded in the world around us through sort of these, these smart technologies. That's what dissolves the product layer and moves us towards experiential financial services as the sort of dominant play from a design perspective. Excellent. Uh, got two final questions and then we're going to go around the panel with your closing thoughts so uh i'm going to throw this one at you miranda 
Um, will online streaming take over the traditional movie hall business? Not my domain of expertise. Um, I, I think it already has, to be honest, to an extent, especially with COVID, you know, people can't even go to, to movie theaters. Um, but it's again about experience. So um, people still like to go and be with each other and how we build up community of the future around entertainment will be um, something quite interesting to watch. Okay. And Jim, your fan club are out there. Oh, you want to have a go at this yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I want to participate. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I belong to a movie club, you know, and each month we go out and watch a movie and go to dinner. And, and I actually kind of wonder at the back end of this, if we'll see a resurgence in live theater with smaller venues where people feel a little bit more safe, a little bit more comfortable when things are a little bit better lit, you know? So I, I just kind of wonder about that. Yeah, in the UK, we've seen a massive sort of upsurge in um, uh, mobile cinema, as in people going to the cars. Yeah, drive-in cinema. Where you take your own food or they provide food for you. And there's loads of them popping up all over the place as a, as a solution. Uh, Cliff, let's give you, no, actually, let's make this the closing question for everyone and you can wrap it into your closing comments. And the, the, Ananya Banerjee really asks, you know, with everything that's going on, uh, how do you see the future of the financial sector? Does it become more open or more closed than it is now? So in your closing comments, just address that as well. And we'll go around. Uh, let's start with you, Elaine. You're, you're top left on my screen. Thank you. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to have to believe it's going to become more open and it's going to deal with the challenges we're talking about now. I think the technology enables us to do that now more than ever. If we don't use it for, for good, I think it's a bit of a sorry stay if we haven't learned anything over the last six months when we don't know what's coming ahead in the future of us. So for me and what I do and, and, and how I try to help, I'm going to have to believe that actually it is going to make a difference and it's going to be more open. Excellent. Cliff, that question, but also any other closing thoughts you want to share? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, really enjoyed. So thank you for inviting me. Um, absolutely more open, but I don't think financial, so apologies for the background noise. I really had to throw the windows open. Um, I, you know, financial services will become much more open. It will not be owned by the financial services industry. It absolutely will not be owned by the banks. I'm old enough to remember what Brett mentioned earlier and Miranda mentioned halfway through, which is turning up to be interviewed by the bank manager if you wanted anything, presenting all your documents, presenting a letter from your headmaster and your father and your grandfather. And if they didn't know you, you didn't get anything. You know, financial services, phone-based, fantastic. Great for people in poverty, as I've spoken about all night. But Facebook, you know, if Facebook allows transfers of money between friends with no charges around the world, that's Western Union, and all those other guys, very usury organizations, sorry if you're in the audience, 48% charges, then you're gone. You know, I just don't see financial services, be, you know, on a retail side being owned by the banks. Commercial, which was something we didn't really touch on tonight, you know, how much is uh, digitalization, et cetera, going to affect commercial banking to fund the big companies, you know, like you've listed on your slides, uh, Roy and, uh, and other people. Commercial banking is harder to move. Um, but, you know, I think retail financial services doesn't belong to banks anymore, and I don't think they care. Okay. Uh, Mihai's asked a question. It said, he said, if you had $100 to invest, what would you invest it in? I'd put it in one of Jim's funds. Um, anyway, let's go on to Jim. Uh, Jim, what, what was your... Uh, more or more closed than your general closing thoughts. Oh, sure, sure. So, so yeah, in response to, to that particular question, um, you know, I think having a strong regulatory environment tends to create um, a barrier to, get to entry. You know, it tends to create less competition because fewer people can play because the stakes are bigger. And what's going on with DeFi is you have an opening of the um, competitive environment because you have less regulation. Um, going down the road, I think it'll be very interesting because a lot of governments will not be able to influence their economies as easily if the monetary system is run outside of central banks. So it's going to be a lot harder to run monetary policy, for example, to get the economy to go through a situation like COVID. So that'll be interesting to watch. Miranda. Yeah, I think 
The future of banking has to be open. And I think we would be doing our customers a disservice to try to keep it closed. I think power comes when we all start to work together and we start to innovate together. And um, that's why I'm so lucky to be a part of my team is because we are we're trying to figure out how we can facilitate the best open future for, for all players in the market and uh, how we can be a leader in that space as well. So. Thank you. Stefan. If I may, yeah, if I may add just one thing, I think the human spirit is unclosable. <laughs> So uh, I see, I think that many countries are going to close and we already see a lot of populistic leader uh, playing this card that we have to be closed, but the financial service, the traditional financial service is going to close in many countries, but all the decentralized blockchain service are going to open. And uh, it's at the beginning, so you don't see it. If you read the newspaper, if you're not part of the community, you don't see it as it was in the 90s with the internet where they think that they thought that the e-commerce was a joke and will never go anywhere. Uh, but uh, I work with blockchain startup and uh, they're doing amazing stuff. And the community is very, very strong and growing very, very fast. Excellent. Brett, Charles, take us out. And you've been incredibly restrained in not talking about your new books. And now's your opportunity to just tell us about this you you talked to me about the book the other day and i think we spent about an hour just yes, talking about the ideas in the book and about three minutes on this webinar um mind-blowing stuff just tell us a little bit about where that book is going and why you're doing it thank you uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity and a great group of people um both from a panelist perspective and the participants um thoroughly enjoyable um so my new book is called the rise of techno socialism and so what it looks at is sort of the, um, the impact of changing economic uncertainty brought about by economic, fundamental economic changes. So um, removing labor supply out of supply and demand with automation, um, in increased political uncertainty and political division, um, you know, big changes in society uh, you know, brought on by the pandemic, racial uh, changes to racial uh, systemic racism, for example, in the United States. And, and since 2000, we've seen a 1,000% uh, um, uh, a 1, increase in protests around the world as a result. All this comes back to the fact that if you look at this time in history, we've got the greatest inequality ever the financial service access to financial services has been a contributor to that but as we have ai ba ai based technology unemployment we have climate shift and all of these things come in it just ramps up that economic uncertainty so we need to have sustainable inclusive plans for the way we deal with humanity as a whole and that's really the aim of the new book is how would how would we construct a you know, what, what is the plan if we want a positive, inclusive, you know, uh, not utopian, because that's too strong a word, but a positive future. And the ultimate outcome is, you know, we, we're not going to get that through capitalism in the free market, because um, capitalism, as we've seen in the midst of coronavirus, has really failed us in respect to making sure everyone's safe and fed and housed, you know. So that's, uh, that's the new book. And I'd love to come back on and talk about that uh, when it's ready for a release, Rohit. But, um, you know, great group. I I will just say on the question about where to invest the US hundred dollars, um, watch for the Ant Technology IPO. Ant Technology is going to be the largest financial institution in the world by 2030. And every other bank in the world will be forced to compete or model themselves on that um, architecture and organization structure. So there you go. Thank you again. But please do not take that as financial advice or any. <laughs> True. Just remember those warnings that Jim gave earlier, and, and that was coming from Brett King, not Rohit Tower or Fast Future. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you all. I mean, we said we were going to end at 8.20, and it is 8.20 now. Uh, it's been a phenomenal session. You've all been incredibly generous with your ideas, your thoughts, your passion. I couldn't have asked for more. And thank you so much to the panelists for also asking such an incredible array of questions that have brought out the very best in our panel. So thank you all and uh, appreciate your time and good luck with all the endeavors that you're involved in coming up next. Bye-bye, thank you.